call to order the Tuesday, April 3rd, 2018 meeting of the Iredell County Board of Commissioners. At this time, if you'll please uh, join us in a moment of silent prayer and reflection, and also please keep in your uh, prayers uh, Commissioner Haup's daughter, Maddie, who uh, underwent an emergency appendectomy this afternoon. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Jones, could you please uh, review any adjustments to the agenda? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We do have three additions. We have two additions under closed session. The first one is property acquisition, which is pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11A5. And the second item under closed session is economic development, pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11A4. We also have one more addition under appointment before the board, which is we'll be having Kent Green here to give us an update on the two-day statewide hurricane exercise. Thank you. Is there, are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Uh, I believe perhaps uh, under new business, uh, Mr. McNeely, Commissioner McNeely has some uh, updates concerning CRTPO and uh, Bridge across the Catawba. Bridge to nowhere. Yeah. So for, with those uh, adjustments, uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda as motion amended? Motion to approve. Motion by Commissioner Norman. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, there are no uh, presentations of any special recognitions or awards this evening. Uh, we do have, as uh, uh, County Manager uh, Jones has outlined uh, three appointments for the board. Uh, first, uh, I'd call uh, uh, Mr. Kent Green. Our emergency services uh, coordinator. And um, for those of you who don't know, uh, there's a two-day exercise being conducted. Uh, it's uh, statewide, I think. Uh, testing emergency preparedness in response to a uh, severe hurricane event uh, similar to Hurricane Hugo, those of us who remember it. And, uh, and I asked uh, Mr. Green to please give us an update and a little bit of insight as to the uh, scope and the purpose of that exercise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You covered uh, a great deal of the exercise itself. We are preparing. <laughs> Uh, to respond to a hurricane very similar to Hurricane Hugo that impacted us in 1989. Um, <clears throat> as you said, this is a statewide exercise, but given the path of this uh, scenario, most of the counties in the western half of the state are participating and playing along with the exercise, whereas the eastern part of the state had their fill of hurricanes last year, so uh, very unlikely that they would need to practice uh, a little more after last fall, last summer. Uh, we've got every department in the county pretty much uh, represented in the Emergency Operations Center. We started at about 7.30 this morning with an activation and went until just before 5 o'clock this afternoon with a shift change at 1. We'll do the same thing tomorrow to allow some of our alternates that work in the Emergency Operations Center to get a little bit more practice in those uh, specific positions. And it also allows us to identify some areas that we may not have thought of in our planning process especially as we move toward the new Emergency Operations Center on Bristol Drive. 
uh, gives us some ideas of uh, how to display some things differently, how to interact with the state differently, and how to communicate better amongst the staff within the EOC as well as the other county departments and administration. Well, Mr. Green, on behalf, I think, of all of the county commissioners and the citizens of this county, I want to thank uh, all the members of uh, our emergency uh, services and all of our departments that have a significant amount of play in terms of arranging uh, shelter and food and uh, restoration of basic services. Uh, so uh, those kind of uh, responses don't just happen. They uh, are not only a plan, but it's not enough to have a plan in a can. You have to have rehearsed and uh, most importantly exercised, you know, the uh, interaction with uh, the other departments, uh, with the other personalities so that uh, when it does happen, no event follows exactly the plan. Uh, uh, I used to say in the Army that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. So what you have to be able to do is adjust from, from that and uh, having the muscle memory of working with people and understanding the resources they bring, have to bring to bear uh, will when the, when the actual storm rolls through, and it's not a matter of if, but when, it's just, uh, it's just gonna happen sometime, then we are gonna be much better prepared to respond. So thank you and, and uh, all of the, the folks that are sitting in that rather small, hot room. <laughs> it's our pleasure, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Okay. Okay, at this time, I uh, ask uh, Jessica Stewart, who is the Director of Communications for the Iowa Economic Development Corporation, to please come up and share with us a presentation concerning the edge factor. Thank you. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate your willingness to learn about the edge factor. I'm positive to, that you'll see its value and how it connects the dots from curriculum to industry. Some of you may recall in 2015, the county created strategic framework that outlined economic <coughs> development, education, and workforce development as a focus for the county. Thank you for your foresight or forethought and leadership because your vision and strategic framework brought all of these partners together to the table to talk about a real problem, the skills and interest gap. The problem is not only affecting our local economy, but also nationally. And I'd like to recognize Todd William. He's, he's here with me today from Iredell Statesville Schools to sh show you our support and partnership collectively as a team. You see, working through this national and local issue, we have the school systems at the table, economic development, chambers of commerce, workforce development, and also business and industry to talk and address the problem. So what is the edge factor? Edge Factor provides regional solutions to national challenges. Today, recruiting and keeping skilled talent in manufacturing is a challenge. This sector suffers from a skills gap as mature workers are retiring and the number of younger workers to fill the positions lag. Georgetown University Center for Education and Workforce suggests that 65% of all the new openings by 2020 will require some form of post-secondary education or training. Many of these jobs will be in healthcare and manufacturing. This study also predicts that the U.S. will fall short by five million wor workers with post-secondary education at the current production rate. And because of your framework, Iredell County partners, along with industry, are working together to build and bridge that skilled labor gap. So what is the edge factor? This is a company, and their mission is to enlighten, engage students, teachers, and parents to connect the dots from curriculum to industry through innovative storytelling. They have created a tool that can be seamlessly implemented and complements the curriculum that's already being taught in the classroom. So I'm here today, and I'm going to show you an overview of the tool. 
The online Edge Factor for Education platform equips educators with real-life stories and accompanying turnkey tools. The deep libraries of videos and activities included in education memberships link to local career opportunities and show how STEAM comes alive in your community. Edge Factor cinematic films have been seen by millions of viewers, and people tell us all the time, Oh yeah, Edge Factor? Love your stories. To which we respond, That's great, but the stories are just the beginning. The films found in the Story Zone captivate audiences. They open the door for more in-depth teaching moments and become the foundation for accompanying videos and activities that showcase careers and make STEAM relevant. One of the key accompanying resources we create are found in the Career Pathway Zone. We've heard from so many school counselors like Susan that they are too busy to help each of their students find their passion and discover careers. Well, that's exactly why we created the Career Pathway Zone. The first thing you need to do when you start in any zone is decide how you want to share this video. Do you want to play it in a classroom, send it home with students, or use it as an outreach tool? For busy school counselors, they often send students home to watch the videos and complete the activities. Each video in the Career Pathway Zone profiles a day in the life of a career and shows how that career uses STEAM. By enabling TouchPoint, educators can show students what kinds of careers exist in their very own community by browsing pictures and descriptions of careers from local businesses. Business leaders like Bob are adding touch points to raise awareness of the careers they offer. He's looking for people to hire, but he needs good people. We call this zone soft skills, but there's nothing soft about essential employability skills. Filled with videos and accompanying activities that teach students about employability skills, this zone helps set students up for success. It covers topics like entitlement, dropping the ball, embracing failure, and hard work, all with a comedic storytelling approach. As Connor prepares for life after high school, he, along with so many of his classmates, are asking, when will I ever use math and science in real life? The science, technology, engineering, and art and math zones are all about making learning relevant for students by showing them real-life examples of when these topics are used. STEAM educators use these videos and lesson plans as the opening act of the chapters or units they have to cover, or as a way to introduce and teach technology. These tools engage students by showing how STEAM is relevant to the real world and even their own community, with touch points that show how science and math are used in local businesses, and what brings STEAM to life more than creating a tangible product. With the Build Project Zone, you can bring Edge Factor stories to life by creating tangible 3D printing and CNC machining projects. 3D print a prosthetic leg as seen in the metal and flesh film or an astronaut from the NASA Hunch film, Reach Beyond. As students take these projects home, it's a great way to spark conversations and reach parents. Reaching parents is a challenge that we hear from educators and workforce development like Frank. In the events and camp zone, we provide you with turnkey event resources that equip you with everything you need to promote your upcoming event, host a main stage presentation, interact with your audience, build hands-on projects, change the perceptions of CTE and manufacturing, inspire girls and minorities to pursue STEM-based fields and manufacturing career pathways, reach parents at home, and receive metrics on the impact of your event. You can send out a code to share content with your audience and reach parents. All of the results are available for for you to view and download in your dashboard. You can assign students to watch a video and complete an activity from different zones and grade them. When your students log into their Edge Factor accounts, they can quickly see the content they've been assigned. Well, that's an overview of the Edge Factor for Education platform. It's an ever-growing platform with a ton of content to impact your community, students, and parents. To learn more about this or any other platform within the Edge Factor suite, contact us. This is just a glimpse into the platform that they have designed and developed to connect the dots between curriculum and industry. As Iredell County could be leading the pack by implementing the Edge Factor for Business platform in our schools, as well as the business platform for business and industry. As you heard, this platform provides lesson plans, videos, and worksheets that can be implemented into the classroom and make it seamless for the teachers. The platform also has a dashboard to track and measure utilization by the users. And we are looking to launch this program into middle schools and high schools this fall. 
This platform is vital to students because it reinforces what's taught in the classroom, teaches soft skills, and connects the dots from math, science, engineering, arts, and technology concepts, and connects it to real life. We collectively, the teams, the school systems, the chambers of commerce, have all come together to put this creative solution in front of you as it resulted out of the blueprint that has been put together. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the Edge Factor for Business membership that we'll be launching as well. Meet Stephanie. Stephanie's high school graduation was right around the corner, but she had no idea what she wanted to do with her life. Her father, David, though eager to help, was unaware of the career opportunities right in their own community. And so they started looking out of town at post-secondary programs in hopes that Stephanie would find herself. This left Bob very frustrated. In fact, Bob was at his wit's end because his business was growing and he was desperate to hire new people. Many of his employees were nearing retirement age, and that's when he vented to Lisa. As part of the economic development team for her community, it's Lisa's responsibility to help local companies prosper and grow. But her biggest challenge was finding people that Bob could hire. And not just anyone. Lisa needs to help Bob find skilled, dependable team members that will stay with the company. But where should they begin? Where to begin was the very same question Susan was asking. As a school counselor dealing with things like bullying, budget cuts, kids without lunches, left little time to help students find career pathways. Until Susan signed into her Edge Factor for Education membership. Within a few clicks, she opened up a world of opportunity and sent Stephanie home with a deep library of videos and interactive activities that highlight career profiles, teach employability skills, and show how STEM comes alive in the real world. Stephanie, along with her father, watched the videos and completed the activities, quickly realizing what types of careers would be a good fit and which ones she would loathe entirely. But David was concerned. If his daughter was going to spend hard-earned money on education, would she actually be able to find a job close to home? That question has Bob feeling a little smug because he already had that covered. Using his edge factor for business Business membership, Bob added a profile and added information on careers within his company. Even though they had never met Bob, Stephanie and her father browsed through these careers and soon realized that she didn't even need to leave town to find great opportunities. Now, Susan, Lisa, Bob, and David are all breathing a sigh of relief, and Stephanie is plotting to take over the world. With the community accessing thousands of story driven resources inside the Edge Factor suite of tools, Little did they know they were creating an ecosystem that would help Lisa, help Susan, help Bob, help David, help Stephanie find a job. That makes things easy. Sometimes it really does take a village. We'll be launching the business platform to industry this summer so they can create local touch points. Let me go back. Sorry. Let me Meet they can create local touch points and they can upload images and videos, descriptions. I'll show you also the platform. So this is the business platform. They can upload what's a typical day like for an employee. They can import skills, pathways, um, information about how you become an engineer. They also have a way, and this is um, something that's evolutionary in the sense of it hasn't been, you haven't been able to, for a company to be able to directly market their internships and opportunities of jobs directly into the, into the schools. The companies can't reach out to the schools, but if the students themselves or the parents themselves have seen, they can reach out to the company. So we're connecting that dot for business and industry into the school system. Um, when they create their touch points, each company will have the ability to market their um, jobs in a 30 mile radius of schools. So if a school in Lincolnton County proceeds to have an Egg Factor for Education membership, which they do, um, an employer in Iredell County can create a touch point in the business um, suite and reach that student in Lincoln County. So we're creating a regional, um, a regional 
effect to the platform as well. Um, to, to do. In addition to the platform, we are going to have a live event um, for our eighth graders. And I'm going to give you two minutes, because that's all I have left, of what a live event will look like. And then I would open it up for questions. There's opportunity everywhere. And I want to tell you guys a few stories. These are people that I have met, people that have impacted my life. And I'm going to do this in a little bit of a, a different format, a little bit of storytelling format. And I call this Head, Hands, Future. And I do that because it's really, really important for you to realize that this journey that you're on right now, every experience plays into who you're going to become. What you're doing in your off time, what you're doing at school, what you're doing with your family, all of these things matter significantly. These are all stories that we have told as Edge Factor. Could it be? The dream of t touching the far reaches of space seems so unlikely, so unreachable. Those nights of dreaming and imagining as you stared into that telescope. Who knew that your dream would be within your grasp so early in life? When your teacher suggested that, well, yet in high school, you would have the opportunity to make components, an opportunity that others would dream about to work with NASA building tools for the astronauts. What an honor, what a privilege, what pressure, knowing that if anything were to fail, that your name would be on the certificate as the one who said that the locker was made correctly, that the quality was there and the part was made to print. I know that you dream about working in aerospace, but how cool is it to think that a rocket ship will bring a locker with your signature on it to the astronauts working on the International Space Station? Ari, do you now understand that the math and the science that at times felt so irrelevant, so unnecessary, are setting you up to pursue your dreams. And this is the third component that we are looking to launch this fall. Um, a live event. This is actually Lincoln County's um, live event for their kids. And that was the actual presentation and Jeremy is the guest speaker. So thank you for your time and I will open it up for questions or comments. You said fall, this fall 2018 you're talking about? Yes, in August. Mm -hmm. Okay. What kind of funding mechanism are you going to need to do that? So, excuse me. Oh, the live events. The live events in September, the um, platform, education platform, we plan on launching, launching it in August. Um, okay. Yes. And Ma James, would, Mr. Malley, would you like me to go over funding and talk yes, about that I in think detail? Go okay. ahead and share that. I so the education platform is a licensed subscription-based platform, so it's based upon brick and mortar. So each um, school would have a license, um, and there are 21 schools that would need a license, and each license is $900 a piece. So for one year, it's $18,900, and um, I would be looking for a commitment for a three-year commitment, and we would... Um, we would um, continue to do a live event as well in partnership in the eighth grade um, to build a pipeline. Um, we feel like the eighth graders register for CTE classes in the fall to go into ninth grade if they are exposed to the edu education platform in the middle school. They have a live event in eighth grade. We could ultimately increase enrollment into CTE programs as well as the internships and then long term it would build into a pipeline for industry. We feel it's important that we launch it in the middle schools and the high schools. Um, actually, industry, we did a local program from industry, and they were the ones, why are we not launching it in high school now? So they felt like that was a vital component to do the middle schools and the high school to bridge, to build the pipeline. And this was, will actually be funded through the Economic Development Corporation. Yes. 
It would be funded through the Economic Development Corporation. Um, we would hold um, pen to paper to fire to make sure that it was being utilized. We've been intangibly working with the school systems to talk about how we would implement it and um, install it on the different devices in the two school systems. Um, so we've been working with them through the logistics. And Jessica, the question I got, uh, <clears throat> for your eighth grade live mm -hmm. uh, performance, yes. we'll call it, uh, will the parents be able to come or can could they be invited at these yes. different schools? We will actually have three live student events. We will have a teacher counselor um, training session um, as well as in the evening a parent event and we are actually going to be inviting industry to all three student events to have a presence as well as being engaged on the parent event to set up tables to actually speak one-on-one -on -one with the parents as well. Okay. I, and, think, I think that's critical because uh, I, I think it's going to be the parents that's going to say okay well there's other options for my child than four-year school or whatever maybe. And so Absolutely I and um, most of their stories really focus around storytelling and inspiring people to do what they're passionate about and inspiring them to work with their hands and their mind that it is an option to make a good career as w and provide for your family. So they don't really talk about much about two-year, four-year degree. It's more about the passion and motivating that person to work in industry. Can you explain the uh, cost to businesses to be able to highlight the uh, career opportunities that they have locally? Um, a business license is $600 for a business to create unlimited amounts of touch points, and that is uploading um, their own videos, pictures, job descriptions, marking their internships. Um, so that is the cost for a business to um, have a business license. It's very impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Can you speak to uh, uh, how uh, Mitchell College, perhaps, Yes. And, uh, utilize this to be able to also engage in with uh, potential uh, folks in the workforce that are out of school. Yes, Mitchell Community College is actually going to have their own individual license for their campus. So they can show and utilize the videos in their classrooms, but also when they're enrolling students and they are working with Edge Factor to highlight um, eight different businesses. Um, with that have students from Mitchell Community College and how they got into industry and that's an, a separate component that Mitchell Community College is working on with Edge Factor. So I will tell you that um, with Edge Factor they are um, creative individuals so if we come with a, an idea they're going to help us implement it and um, they believe it's a partnership it's a journey and it's something that they're will, that we're going to be working on with them continuously so if we commit we'll be con on, a, on a journey with Edge Factor. Well, uh, guys, you're just going to have to indulge me. Go ahead. For, Go ahead. Well, and, and I'm not on the clock. Because <laughs> this is exciting and important stuff. Um, you may want to sit down. It may be a while. <laughs> I, I tell you, I'm going to put you through the paces. Uh, you know, w when our economic development team, consisting of uh, Commissioner McNeely and myself, work with our economic development corporations, uh, previously, the, the Morrisville South Iredell Economic Development Corporation and the Greater uh, uh, or the Statesville Regional Development Corporation, uh, which are merging, by the way, in South to, uh, to uh, create a uh, Iredell County Economic Development Corporation effective 1 July, which will uh, enable us to market all of the opportunities to businesses uh, throughout the county. Uh, understanding that uh, each area has unique characteristics uh, to offer to businesses. Um, and before, they may have shown up on the doorstep of one development corporation, and if it didn't quite, wasn't quite the right fit, then they just disappeared and went someplace else in the state or the southeast or wherever. And this way, uh, we're able to share uh, all areas of the county uh, and market uh, more effectively the opportunities that we have for business. But as our Economic Development Task Force is working on that perspective, our Education Task Force with uh, uh, Commissioner Norman and uh, Commissioner Haup uh, have been uh, engaged in 
uh, working with the schools to uh, uh, lash up uh, an understanding between our roles as commissioners, their roles as, bo as boards of education, and be able to focus on achieving the desired commonly held goal of uh, educating our children uh, and giving them the best start in life. Uh, what we discovered, and, and we've been successful in recruiting industry, uh, you know, we've had, you know, five projects uh, that have uh, been announced probably in the last nine months that uh, uh, combine uh, nearly a thousand uh, uh, jobs and uh, uh, some $87 million worth of investment in Iredell County. Uh, in the pipeline, they haven't been announced yet, but there are at least 10 projects uh, that can add another uh, uh, 500 or so jobs and another 300 uh, plus million dollars of investment. So uh, Iredell County has the basic uh, uh, building blocks for business uh, when they come and look. It's got good infrastructure. We have good infrastructure. We have good quality of life. We have good schools. We have uh, good transportation, obviously, with two interstates. Uh, all the water and sewer that can reach most, service most of those uh, companies. Um, and we have available land. Uh, but the long pole in the tent today is workforce. Uh, any company that's come and wants to know, are we going to be able to uh, provide uh, a uh, stable and uh, educated workforce to be able to meet their needs in advanced manufacturing or advanced logistics or whatever it is that they're uh, looking at uh, doing. And uh, so workforce development then has become more of an issue, particularly since our unemployment rate in the last three years has gone from 7% to um, you know around four percent, which is uh, traditionally considered a full employment number. Um, so, when companies have come to us as a as a board seeking you know uh, reasons to locate in Iredell County, they'll often ask about this workforce issue. And fortunately, we've been able to tell them, yes, we can get you that workforce. Uh, and a large reason of that is because we have a large number of folks coming from other counties surrounding us into Iredell County. We are an employment center. And almost 20,000 uh, workers come into this county from some other county surrounding us on a daily basis. Uh, so we've been able to say, well, yeah, we have a pipeline. Uh, if we don't have it right here, we've got a pipeline in our neighboring counties. But we can't count on that, not forever. Uh, that's, that's been an opportunity uh, that will, will diminish over time as they, as other counties begin to develop their own uh, employment centers and uh, people choose to work closer to home. Uh, we certainly don't want to have to create a pipeline out of state. Um, so where's that other pipeline come from? Well, it comes internally. You know, when, I, when it really hit home to us as commissioners, I think, was when one, we heard about one uh, a potential uh, uh, business uh, indicating, yes, you know, we want to hire 150 people uh, and build a plant. Is that going to be a problem? No, no problem. But then they say, if we're going to add two or three additional shifts, that's what's in our five-year plan. You know, businesses actually plan five and ten years down the road. And uh, we're going to add another 300. Well, when you think about, well, that's a large number. In five years from now, these other counties, that may not be available. Uh, where are we going to get folks five years from now to fill these jobs? Well, if you do some backwards plan and you think who's going to be uh, graduating from high school available to, to uh have learned the skill sets and the soft skills and the certifications to be able to be employed, um, those kids that are going to be hired five years from now are seventh graders today. So we have to be able to reach back into our middle schools and to establish this pipeline and be able to not only inspire you know kids with a passion for uh, learning 
and, and the soft skills of, you know, values and uh, uh, accountability, uh, choices, lifestyle choices, all those things, lifelong learning, ability to work as a member of a team, uh, all those are things that you just don't uh, go to a class to get. Those are inculcated over time, uh, and they're sort of baked into wh who you are by the time you graduate from high school. Well, uh, in order to uh, uh, be able to establish that pipeline, the, you know, the long pole in the tent is, well, how do you get this into the schools? Now, our schools have done a great job of divine, uh, devising pathways, and they'll be rolling those out over the, uh, this next year uh, within the school system so that kids can see that, you know, okay, if I want to be able to, uh, if this is something that in, lights my, you know, lights a fire under me you know, that I'm passionate about, uh, how do I get there? It's relevant to what I'm learning in the classroom. Now I know why I'm doing uh, algebra or trigonometry. Uh, which I, I never understood. <laughs> and, and perhaps if somebody had shown me something that you could use with trigonometry, I might have connected the dots. But, you know, most kids don't. Well, this is a, a way to be able to do that. And unfortunately, those skill sets that we need in business uh, and what's expected in business today is not really understood by those in the teaching profession because they've been focused on educating in an academic environment and they have not had a lot of interaction with businesses to be able to explain to kids in a concrete way how what they're learning in the classroom is going to relate to what they're going to need when they are adults and in the workforce. Um, and that's sort of a long pole in the tent. How do you connect the dots between business and, and schools? The, uh, and, and businesses have been on the receiving end for many years, you know, when all you needed was a large pool of, of uh, folks willing to work, uh, then you didn't have to work hard at being able to find them. Uh, you just sat back and waited for the schools to just send them across the stage as uh, high school graduates, and then you had your pick. Well, our business has, businesses are going to have to be much more intentional, much more involved in terms of, of uh, communicating and sharing with our uh, educators what skill sets and opportunities are available after graduation. Um, the, the, the hard part is how do you get that done? I mean, guidance counselors today spend most of their time focused on testing and college prep. And that's driven by requirements that are generated out of the uh, North Carolina Department of Education. And uh, the guidance as late as two years ago was that uh, the goal in North Carolina was to have uh, two out of three high school graduates go to a four-year college produ uh, diploma producing school, four-year university. And that's just not practical. Anyone that just knows averages and, and what people want to do or like to do know that two-thirds of our students are not going to go to a four-year college. Not, not to mention the expense, it's just the motivation to do that. And it's too expensive to go just to find yourself these days. So um, the reality is about a third go to college, and our schools do a bang-up job of getting our kids that want to go into a four-year institution into the best institutions, I think, available in any state with 16 university systems to choose from and a very uh, affordable uh, uh, tuition, uh, room, and board. Uh, but that's a third, and we take care of them. They have IB programs. We have early college programs. We have advanced placement programs. Uh, they are well equipped. But there's never been really an intentional focus on the other two-thirds of the kids out there. 
And Mitchell College has been our secret weapon for many years in terms of being able to transition into associate's degrees or uh, certification programs and all that. But, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And if kids are getting out of high school and the parents and the students and the teachers and the guidance counselors don't know what's going on in business, then they don't know where to look. They don't know how to get there. So both these task forces, education and, and, and economic development, have come to the conclusion that, you know, those two focuses of our county are joined at the hip. You can't separate them. Uh, but it's not enough just to have economic development. It's not enough just to have good education. We've got to get them together. And uh, so uh, our school systems working on pathways and all of that are going to, that's the heavy lifting. That's creating curriculums that can guide students where they want to go. But they have to figure out where to go. So it's sort of like, you know, we're getting in the vehicle of life of our choice. If you'll hang with me for a minute on this analogy. But, you know, you're getting in this vehicle, and the engine is, is our education system. And our education system is, you know, it's gone from, you know, years ago, a four-cylinder sort of, you know, mass production model to a uh, highly focused, uh, outstanding, punch above your weight class kind of school system, both Iredell State School schools and Mooresville graded schools. Um, so we have a really good engine. You know, it's V8, you know, I'm not a mechanical guy, but it's got all the you know, bells and whistles that uh, uh, you know, Vice Chairman Bowles could uh, elaborate on it's about what, what goes under the hood. It's a Hemi, it's got a Hemi. Yeah. Him. Anyway, uh, that's what's in the vehicle. Uh, the, pro the problem is uh, the vehicle isn't going anywhere <laughs> very much. And w where the rubber meets the road, you know, that's, that's, our, that's the jobs and the, our employers out there. They're going to get you to your personal destination, whatever that may be. So we're, it's like we're in neutral. We're not, you know, you've got this engine, it's making a lot of noise, and you're not getting a lot of movement. The problem, what we've been lacking, if you go back to rear wheel drive technology, is we've been lacking a differential that can translate all that energy produced down the crankshaft to the axles. And that's what the edge factor is. It's a little differential there. Actually, it's a pretty good differential. But the cost of that differential is a rounding error in comparison to the cost of the engine for education or the investment that business people put in to the vehicle itself. But without that dif differential, that vehicle just doesn't go very far, very fast at all. And that's what, you know, and that seemed to be the, the most intractable issue to me was how do you educate everybody? On those, all these opportunities out there. How do you get businesses involved across the board, not just the major uh, employers, but the 10 and 20 and 30 employee uh, businesses? How do you get them to connect? This is how you do it. Uh, they can produce their own videos uh, for the cost that it takes for a business to invest like this. You know, if you were engaging headhunters, That'd be about a day and a half's worth of head hunting, you know. Uh, this is something that can resonate with kids. It can, you can give it to teachers who can, before they teach us a, uh, a subject, can do a three-minute video. This is what this, what you're going to learn here equips you to do what's been presented here. And then kids can connect the dots. And then they can take it home and get parents to connect the dots. Because how many people you say, you don't want to go into manufacturing. You know, it's dirty. It's, uh, uh, you know, I worked in manufacturing and I, you know, got laid off. I had to go from job to job. And, and there's just not many of those jobs around. And you need to go to college. Because that's what we've been told is the way to achieve the American dream. Well, you know, the... the the fact is, you can go into these advanced manufacturing facilities. You can eat 
your dinner off the floor. That's how clean and pristine they are. And the, uh, the uh, income levels that can be generated just shortly after high school, if we can connect people up with the North Carolina Manufacturing Institute, our ACT certifications, if they're intentional, they can walk out the door with and, and basically be employed. There's a lot of companies out there that would be happy to get somebody in and, and train them themselves about their specific job requirements. And they can be making a, a salary or income of forty to fifty to sixty thousand dollars out the door. I know kids who have graduated from college can't make that kind of money because they don't have the skills that the businesses are looking for. Correct. So uh, this is this is kind of a a uh, paradigm shift, if you will, about how we look at how we collaborate and lash up our businesses with our educators and our uh, government, and it works for government employees too. We have a large number of folks who are going to be retiring that are baby boomers, and we need to replace them with high-speed employees across all of our departments. And so there's career opportunities there, but most people don't know what local government does or how it does it. We have an opportunity to share our story. So. Uh, I, I appreciate your indulgence to my fellow commissioners for my uh, going off on a bit of a jag here, but uh, this is this is the kind of, of effort that I wanted to highlight for everyone to understand uh, how important it is and the long-lasting impacts it will have in Iredell County because no longer will our kids have to leave this county to get a job or feel like they have to or feel like they have to spend a lot of money that's on tuition when really they don't. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say that they don't, can't be, they're gonna have to be lifelong learners. You know, the jobs that uh, today uh, are most in demand didn't exist 10 years ago. So if there's a constant in life, it's change. And that's just accelerating in this economy, this information, knowledge-based economy. So uh, anyway, uh, I want to thank uh, Jessica for uh, finding this little diamond in the rough and uh, being able to present it. And I can tell you those uh, business people that have seen it are very enthusiastic. We'll be relying on the Chambers of Commerce to be able to reach out to their business community, their membership, and be able to... Uh, uh, work their end of this whole process. Absolutely. It is a partnership. So thank you for your support and partnership on this journey and building our industry um, a pipeline of skilled and qualified workers. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Okay, and I've used up my quota of talking for the rest of the night. Okay, now. We'll see about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't take it to the bank. Okay, uh, we now have an opportunity for uh, a request from Amy Isley from uh, Stop Child Abuse Now Center. Come on up, Amy. Well, I, I thought maybe we might be getting a proclamation. I may be mistaken, but I, I, I wanted to make you all aware that this is Child Abuse Prevention Month, and um, we are doing a variety of things in this county to underscore that for everyone. Um, one of the things we are doing is on the 10th of April, we are having a, a kind of a mini ceremony at the courthouse. We've got, if you go by, you'll see pinwheels all over the, the, the new front of the courthouse just to remind us that children should be safe, should be playing, should be kids. And um, so we want you, you know, everybody to be aware of that. They should be in a situation where there should be no abuse and, and neglect. So we're working really hard at SCAN to let people be aware of this and to keep our families safe. Also wanted to let you know that one of the things that we wanted of, of, of all of you, if you can, is on the 12th of April, 
um, which is a Thursday after lunchtime at noontime from noon till one, we will be having at the Civic Center um, a luncheon. It, it's really a, 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 a benefit luncheon for for SCAN, but and the and the the meal of course is free. But I, and I'm not inviting you to give to give us money. I'm inviting you to see. <laughs> How we have, how you have helped us in the past to reach some of the people and and um, some of the things that we have done to work towards keeping our our families, our children in Iredell County um, safe, and um, see how we're spending your money. So that's what I wanted to especially have you know th this month. Well, thank you, uh, Amy, and we do have a proclamation. Okay. And so. Uh, <laughs> I will go ahead and read that into the record, and then we will vote and uh, make it official. So we have a proclamation, Child Abuse Prevention Month, Iredell County, North Carolina. Whereas children are vital to our state's future success, prosperity, and quality of life, as well as being our most vulnerable assets, and whereas safe, stable, nurturing homes and communities are needed to foster healthy growth and development for all children, and whereas child abuse and neglect is a community responsibility affecting both the current and future quality of life of communities, and whereas communities that provide parents with the social support, the knowledge of parenting and child development programs, and the concrete resources needed to cope with stress and to nurture their children ensure that all children grow up to their full potential, and whereas effective child abuse prevention strategies are known to succeed when there are partnerships created by citizens, human services agencies, schools, faith communities, health care providers, civic organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community. Uh, is there a motion to adopt uh, this proclamation? Mr. Chairman, I will move that we adopt this proclamation. Okay. Motion by uh, Vice Chairman Bowles. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Now, therefore, the Iredell County Board of Commissioners hereby proclaim April as Child Abuse Prevention Month and calls upon all citizens, community agencies, faith groups, medical facilities, elected leaders, and businesses to increase their participation in efforts to support families, thereby preventing child abuse and strengthening the communities in which we live. Adopted this third day of April 2018. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a, a big piece of helping our families to is, is to help them find jobs and to help them support their children in education and to look beyond just college. Um, education is really important, but there's so many kinds of education. And when they feel like this is attainable, it makes a difference. Okay. Thank well, you. thank you, Amy. Appreciate all that you and uh, the dedicated volunteers and staff at uh, SCAN provide for our uh, most vulnerable citizens. Thank you very much. All right, at this time, we will move into uh, a series of three public hearings. Our first is a public hearing to consider a request from Camco Inc. to rezone approximately one acre on Brawley School Road. And Mr. Todd, you will kick that off. Good evening to the board. The uh, first rezoning request is on the screen outlined in blue. It's currently zoned RO, which is residential office, which allows office type uses uh, as well as residential. Um, each side of it, there's some neighborhood business and then some additional RA, which is residential agricultural. Um, the horizon plan does call for this area to be developed commercially. Uh, traffic impact should not exceed capacity. And planning board also recommended six and zero in favor of this request. Directly across the street is the uh, Mooresville Municipal Planning Area. And I've got just a few images here. Uh, this is the land use map showing the corridor commercial for the area. Uh, there's an aerial of the property. 
to the residential and the commercial uses in that area. Uh, just another image of the property. Uh, standing on Brawley School Road looking at the property. Looking directly across at the Mooresville jurisdiction. Uh, this is on the back side. Uh, that's web foot that you see and that's looking across web foot into some land that has recent be, recently been cleared. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about this request. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Uh, Mr. Todd, the, um, <clears throat> the area that's been cleared there, what, what are the buffering requirements on the piece that is the subject piece of property as it relates to the RA beside of it? and as it relates to the other commercial on the other side. Okay, the, the area that had been cleared in the images is actually across web foot. Um, now the buffering for RO or NB, either one, is basically a 20 foot landscaping screening that goes along this property line. That 20 foot screening basically is composed of canopy trees, understory trees and shrubs um, and it's based on a numbers every hundred feet. So that'd be 20 <coughs> foot width along this property line. Once this property gets developed is when that trigger would come in place. As far as buffering on these lines, because it's already commercial on both sides, there would be no additional screening uh, for those commercial properties on both sides of it. So a developer on the subject piece could actually remove trees all but 20 feet of those trees where it uh, is adjacent to the RA and provided that the trees that are left are sufficient to meet the criteria of our ordinance then that would suffice if not they could add plantings correct uh, yes we do look at existing vegetation and take it in consideration when we can um, so it'd be it's basically on a case-by-case -case basis depending on what's removed we'd go out there and evaluate the site see if it's going to meet those code requirements. If not, then ask them to put in the additional required screening. Mr. Todd, can a street be cut from webbed foot road to Brawley School Road through that piece of property? Uh, not through this piece of property. The, the piece of property in question has a little bit of road frontage down here on webbed foot. I think that measures approximately 25 feet. With our buffer requirement of 20 feet coming off of this sideline, that doesn't leave enough space. Sometimes we'll let a developer put a driveway in a buffer when they don't have another option. This piece has all of Brawley School Road to put a commercial driveway on. So our 20 foot buffer is gonna take up most of their 25 foot. Now, if they can get some type of easement or access through one of these other properties, that's not really part of the request, but that could happen. As far as this particular piece, um, they would not be able to have a driveway cut on their property, on that backside. Did it have to come off Broad School Road then, to enter that property? Yes, or unless they got some type of other access through one of these other properties. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Todd, all right, uh, Camco, correct me if I'm wrong, they already own the NB to the, we'll call it the left, because I'm not sure if that's the south or the east, whichever way you want to call this. <clears throat> so they will own three parcels then, because this is they're also the owning this, and I think they actually own that parcel there too also. They do, so they'll, they'll own this one, both of these that are NB, and then the subject piece as well. And there's there's already some kind of a makeshift driveway coming in on that piece. No, the, go to your left. There we go. My left, your right, I reckon. Whatever. Uh, there's a makeshift driveway there <coughs> there now, which they could interconnect those three parcels together, and still have access on the web foot. Is that correct? I think so. Yes. It, is that a driveway that's just been put in or is, is that permitted or? we'd have to look to see if there's been a driveway permit issued by DOT on that 
Because that's not actually a part of the request tonight. Correct. If, if you were, uh, if there was no access to Brawley School Road, given the R20 development on Webfoot Road, would you be recommending a, a commercial uh, type zoning with access solely to Webfoot? You know, th this, one's, this one has a lot of history on it. This original commercial RO, all this was RO since 1984. So it definitely has some history down there to be set in place to be commercial. Um, so changing over to NB really isn't that big of an intense change. Neither NB or RO do not allow outdoor storage. Um, they basically, you're gonna have a building and a parking lot. Uh, you're not gonna have outdoor storage of equipment or outdoor storage of um, products for sale. So, you know, the change is pretty minimal. Um, there are some additional uses, but uh, based on that, you know, and again, the land use plan, that's what we're gonna hinge a lot on uh, is it shows it corridor commercial for that area. And that, and that corridor is based on Brawley School Road, right? Correct. I'm just asking, okay, if you have a resident, an R20 residential neighborhood adjacent to it, you know, uh, is, and, and across the street you have this commercial property that's commercial in a commercial corridor because of Brawley School Road, then, uh, is it appropriate to have commercial traffic of whatever type uh, funneled in onto Webfoot Road? With it, with it being a neighborhood business scale zoning, um, that does seem to fit. I mean, Webfoot is a state maintained road, so it's not just a private subdivision road that doesn't have state maintenance. Uh, so from that point, uh, yeah, the neighborhood business. I mean, that you are going to see neighborhood business right next to the R20 or RA or any of our residential zoning districts. You know, if it was a GB request or even HB, that's getting more out there to where you would potentially see some issues. That's all right to, that's all right to the east of it down there, too, which is someday going to be MB. Are there any other questions it's for Mr. Turner? Right on top of it. No more questions. Thank you, Mr. Todd. At this point in time, I'll open the public hearing and ask uh, Ms. Gaither, do we have anyone signed up? No, sir. There's no one signed up to be heard. I would inquire of anyone in the audience if uh, they want to be heard on this matter. Hearing and seeing none, I will close this public hearing and uh, ask if uh, the pleasure of the board is. Mr. Chairman, my, my biggest concern there is the fact that, that there will be, that there could be ingress and egress to webbed foot road. And I'm not sure that's a good plan for that particular area. Uh, even though Brawley School Road has been up fit to be pretty much a super street um, still I think if you create avenues for a back way out or a back way in I think the general public's going to use those and uh, I, I just I just have reservations on on that the, the whether a street can be cut in there or not uh, this is a unique piece of property the way that uh, webbed foot drive webbed foot road lays in there I don't think there's a lot of places down Broadway School Road that this situation occurs but um, but that is my only reservation of can a street be cut in there later and at this particular point someone would have to submit a plan for I guess a subdivision permit would they not or would they go directly to um, DOT Mr. Todd could you address that to, what's to the develop, procedure to de develop the property no to, to get a street cut to webbed foot. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna work with DOT on a driveway permit. If they're well, either side, Brawley School Road side or webbed foot, they start with DOT, and it does also get reviewed by us.
to make sure because we have some requirements on driveway spacing, et cetera. I have some heartburn on this one for the fact that I think that once all those lots are put together, you're going to have interconnectivity with a, a, a unknown driveway leading to a residential R20 neighborhood that's been well established. How hard is it going to be to find out that driveway, whether it's actually a DOT issued driveway or somebody's idea three pieces of culvert put down and we got a way to get out of brawly traffic uh, that would just be us reaching out to dot and see what they have on file and if it comes back that it was something that the landowner just chose to put in their self could it be shut down or would it be left grandfathered or what would it be if it wasn't issued it, well, at that point, I mean, it's up to DOT, but most likely if it's not been permitted, they're going to just ask for the owners to apply for a driveway permit and work with them on that application process. And I, I don't know. I mean, nothing jumps out at me as a reason for DOT to turn a driveway permit down uh, based on the speed limit that's in that area, based on the, the curve. I don't see anything, so I imagine they would actually get a permit from DOT for that location if they haven't already. Is the applicant present tonight? Yes. Yes. Could we talk about that? Um, there is that driveway you come to the podium. If you would come to the podium and state your name and address, sir, please. James Miller, um, my business partner and I, we own the property. Um, that culvert they're talking about was actually put in by DOT during the construction to allow us to aggress our property during Brawley School Road construction, whether they're putting sidewalks, driveways, per stuff. It's not really used much like that. And as far as a road, no, it will never be a road through there. Matter of fact, we've actually had to put barrels up there to keep, keep people from cutting through. <laughs> so we are very aware of the potential of a cut through. The only reason there would be people cutting through not to, if, if there's a heavy backup of traffic. But they would, most of them would go on around Webfoot and come out on canvas back and go up canvas back. Um, and that area they showed was just been cleared, has just recently been cleared. They've actually seeded it over, um, put straw down, seeded it over. So I'm not sure, you know, they have it set up for homes. But um, that has just recently happened. That's how Mallard had paid for their improvements on the golf course to selling off those lots. I, I just, my heartburn is that. It becomes neighborhood business, and you always want your trucks to, you know, deliver in the rear of your store. And next thing you know, they go, well, you know, the best way to get in here is going to be go down through Canvas back and come up Webfoot, and we'll go in the back way there and drop off our tractor trailer and back in and unload. And I, I can't speak to that. Who knows in 20 years, five years, one year, what will happen? It's impossible for me to tell you it will or will not. That would be up to, to me, the planning board. And the guys will say, hey, you know, we can't have that, or yes, that's fine. Well, at this point, we couldn't stop you if we go along with the zoning like it is. Well, I don't, I mean, I, I think what he said that they have to approve everything. I mean, we aren't developing it right now. We're just trying to get everything lined up. In other words, we have property on the left-hand side up there, and then the other NB on the right-hand side. We're just trying to get it all lined up with the Mooresville, with that approval, that plan y'all approved, I guess everybody approved. When you develop, uh, when the property is developed, it'll most likely be developed under the Morsel standard. You're going to ask for water and sewer. Yeah, I mean that's the only way you could develop. Morsel is going to take it over, and they're going to get involved. Let I me mean, be honest with you. There is no sewer on that property. The pump, the pump line comes up from food line on that property. Mm -hmm. There is no fall line for that property at this point. So I don't know how that would happen or whatever. I'm, that's why I am not a developer. That's way beyond my expertise. The one piece that is not in Camco's name, is that somebody that you're affiliated with? or No, uh, those four pieces on the left were bought up under Camco, Kruger, Allen, and Miller. Don Allen was part of it at one time. And um, that this back corner that's actually on Webfoot was owned by Billy Allen. And some of them, he lost it somehow. I don't know how he lost it. But somebody else there, and they're trying, but it's zoned RO. And I know that they had to try to change it one time, and it didn't work out. But the property we have 
They showed that property when they shot that view of that dirt back there. It was shot from that corner, and believe me, it's full of poison ivy and brambles. <laughs> it's not real. I mean, and with a 20-foot setback, I mean, if I was developing it, I'd be more than willing to put whatever they need in there. I think he's already got the 20-foot buffer, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. He went out there and walked it. I mean, I know some of the guys have walked it. It's a full 20-foot buffer between us and that house. And that house bought that property since this the big old long shape lot is RO. And uh, those people with the RA who bought that house, they bought it knowing that. So it's not a surprise to them. They're not here to argue. Nobody was here at the planning board meeting. There's nobody here to speak against it. So I just don't. If the neighborhood was upset about it, we'd hear about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No. All right. Is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I had a lot of questions and reservations about this particular piece of property as we were speaking in pre-agenda, but uh, most of my concerns have been addressed, and uh, I feel like I can make the motion to approve this rezoning this evening. Motion by uh, Vice Chairman Bowles to uh, approve the request. Is there any further discussion? I Matthew, there's no way after this is we've laid this on and out that we're going to be able to referee that driveway until they change that from RO to NB or some other zoning, and then at that time we could address it. Is that correct? No, no way to referee it as far as them getting access through some of these other lots. Exactly. But like I said, if they come and those lots are they want to move them from RO to NB. At that point in time, we could, because right now the lot that's in question doesn't have a driveway, but the lot that we're worried about does, but they're owned by the same. Correct. If later on one of these decided to go from RO to NB, at that point, conditional zoning could be looked at as far as a condition to keep driveway access limited to Brawley School Road. You know, right now, even though these are same ownership, a couple of them, they are separate lots. So DOT is going to be forced, really, to give them access to Web Foot if it came an issue for development, because that is their only side of access. But later on, through another request, I think you could condition it as long as there's some similar ownership there. green space that back left lot we we don't rezone it, don't want to rezone it because it will be green space one of these days if anybody develops those lots on Broadway School Road that's just going to be simple green space whether Mooresville or Iredell County it requires it that's what it's set there for that's what it's there for it's green space and a developer whether it be you or someone else they want to front Broadway School Road they want to hang their shingle out on Broadway School Road and honestly, that lot back there, the, the back right lot next to commercial is owned. And we actually gave Billy Allen access. He has, a, or that, that lot has a legal access through our property of Broadway School Road. So anybody that does want to develop that back cor right corner lot, they do have legal dead deeded access through our parking lot to Broadway School Road. And that's already on a deed somewhere. Yeah. We did that as a favor to Billy. He wanted to move his his uh, engineering offices there and just never did. It was all Don Allen, Miller, and Kruger. That's where Camco came from. Mr. Chairman, could I wordsmith my motion? Yes, if you'd like to uh, amend your motion. I'd like to amend my motion to include the proper language on a motion like this. And uh, I would like to make a motion to approve the uh, zoning map amendment and to make the findings that that the approval is consistent with the adoption of the 2030 Horizon Plan. And that said approval is reasonable and in the public's best interest and furthers the goals of the 2030 Horizon Plan because it contains within a, it's contained within a commercial zoning corridor and it's adjacent to commercially zoned property and the traffic impact should not exceed road capacity. Motion by Vice Chairman Bowles. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign.
Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your uh, sharing some background. Someday we're going to close that road. <laughs> okay. We'll now move on to item 7.2, which is a public hearing to consider a request from Robert Tarr to rezone approximately 13.579 acres on Flower House Loop. Mr. Todd. Okay, this uh, property, again, is outlined in blue on screen. It's just south of the exit 42 on 77, sandwiched between Flower House Loop and 77. Uh, the plan does call for this area to be corridor commercial. Uh, the property is adjacent to the interstate and near other commercial uses. A large portion of it is taken up by Duke Power right away, which does impede some of the development of the property. And uh, this request is conditional uh, per the application. And there was a public input meeting held on site uh, with about seven residents that showed up with questions. I do not believe there was any opposition at that point. And planning board did vote 6-0 in favor of this request. Again, just the uh, 2030 horizon plan showing the area to be corridor commercial. This is an aerial of the property, and you can see that Duke Power right away going through the property. Another image of the property. And looking at, that's Flower House Road. It's property that you're looking at. Looking across Flower House. Uh, properties on our left, looking down Flower House. So any piece of property can be sold. I'd be happy to answer any questions on this one. Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, Gracie Lane, I assume that is a dedicated state road then, or is that a private driveway with an easement of some kind or right away? Gracie Lane is just a basically a name driveway. Okay. That's just where 911 named it so they can get an ambulance down there. Yes. It looks like we're creating a donut hole there. Um, both, uh, uh, and, and you're going to have uh, a commercial zoning with, with that RA little, little, little spot in the middle of it. What's your anticipation? Do you think that little spot will become part of this project at a later date? Uh, I'd say there's a good chance later, later date it does. Um, again, because this was conditional, there was that public input meeting. Um, you know, we just haven't heard any opposition, so it seems that those owners are not opposed to the request at this point. Okay. So obviously they're aware of it because they would have received a letter for a Correct. adjacent property owner. Yes. The yellow sign is up there. I saw it today. And, uh, and the, the applicant he is here, and I believe he can probably speak to some conversations with those owners. That's a hard piece of property there with that power line going through it. It's just a hard piece of property to develop, isn't it? It is. Because of that power line right away, there's, there's going to be limitations on structures built. But as far as open storage or open use of it, the power is usually okay for that type of use. Right. Any uh, additional questions? Okay. Thank you, Matthew. This time I will open the public hearing. Uh, is anyone signed up to be heard? No one's been signed up. I'll inquire of the audience if anyone would like to be heard on this matter. Hearing or, he hearing or seeing none, I will close the public hearing and ask if there's any further discussion. Is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Motion to approve the zoning map amendment and to make a finding that the approval is consistent with the adopted 2030 horizon plan and that said approval is reasonable and in the public interest and furthers the goals of the 2030 horizon plan because development is conditional per the submitted request. It is contained within a future commercial corridor and traffic impacts will not exceed road capacity. Commissioner uh, McNeely's motion. Uh, any further discussion? I'd like to make one comment. I'm proud of you that you could read that from here. Yes. It's great. Well, I had to read it off the paper. I, 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 I couldn't see it on the paper, but I can read far away. Okay. <laughs> well, 
between all of us, we compensate for our yeah. We make a good team, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Wonder Twin Powers. <laughs> okay, uh, motion by Commissioner McNeely. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. <laughs> On to our third public hearing. This is uh, calling for a closure of an unnamed road and dedicated right, road right of way located, located off Campanile Drive in Mooresville and consider adopting an order to close said road right of way. Mr. Todd? Okay, this uh, request uh, is due to the, uh, the plat that was recorded for this subdivision originally showed a stub out. Uh, stub outs required for any time there's a large track adjacent to this subdivision to make sure there's the connectivity requirements. Uh, we've had a property owner buy the piece of, or the lots on both sides of the stub out and in order to make the best use of the land they've bought, they're actually proposing to close the existing stub out and move it to the edge of their property so their property is not split by the stub out. In order to do so, they'll, they need to go through this formal process to close the existing one um, all at the same time while they'll be platting a new one that meets the code requirements. Any additional questions for Mr. Todd? Open the public hearing. Is anyone signed up? No, sir. There's no one signed up to be heard. I'll inquire if anyone in the audience desires to be heard. Seeing or hearing none, I'll close this public hearing and ask if there's a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would make the motion that we close this unnamed road uh, off of uh, Campanile Drive and grant this applicant his request. A motion by Vice Chairman Bowles. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Todd. Okay, at this time, we'll move on to administrative matters uh, that uh, were appropriate uh, to consider for a consent agenda, which we uh, reviewed at our pre-agenda meeting at 5 o'clock. And I would uh, ask our county manager, Ms. Jones, to please summarize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the following matters were reviewed. There was a request from Planning and Development for approval of amendments to the Platte Review Officer listing for Iredale County. A request from Planning and Development for approval of documents related to the Essential Single Family Rehabilitation Pool Program, which is roughly about a $175,000 grant. Once those funds are expended, we do have the opportunity to go back to that pool if there are remaining funds. Request from the Finance Department to award a formally bid contract to Advance One Development to construct improvements to the solid waste landfill gas system. This was a base bid plus one alternate for a total cost of $405,634. A request from the county attorney to discuss a notice to government entities receiving court costs and fines. And there was a consent for a standing objection for the county attorney to file this. And then a request from the clerk to the board to approve minutes from the meeting on March the 20th, 2018 with noted corrections. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Is there a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda, Mr. Chairman. Motion by uh, Commissioner Norman. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, those like sign, motion carries unanimously. Uh, this evening, we have neither any announcements nor appointments to any boards and commissions. Uh, no unfinished business that I'm aware of. Uh, this is not a public comment period month. That will come uh, two weeks from now. Uh, we do have uh, a, a couple of items of new business uh, from uh, Mr. McNeely. Uh, first, Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion to call for a public hearing on April the 17th, 2018 at 7 p.m. regarding an economic development incentive of up to 131000 over a five-year period for project cutting edge based on up to $7.8 million investment in Iredell County. You leaped ahead, but we'll go ahead and take it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> trying to see where you had that in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the motion, uh, we did have a closed uh, session where we reviewed that economic development request. Uh, motion uh, by Commissioner McNeely. Any further discussion? 
All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries <laughs> unanimously. Well, let me leap backwards now, probably. All right. All right. Uh, as far as our property acquisition, is that the one we need to do, or do you want me to go ahead and talk about? I don't think we. Uh, I don't think we had any action that we needed to do on the no. property acquisition. Yeah, we had a motion. We got a motion. I think we decided that that uh, there wasn't a requirement. They're uh, just giving direction to there the. There was. Uh, there was just a decision given direction to the manager yeah. to to negotiate on the board's behalf and bring back. That's correct. Right. I, b I believe he has a motion for the second item. Okay. Yeah. This I'll is not sure. for, uh, this is out there at our ECOM, that piece of property. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Mr. Chairman, I'd also I'd like to make a motion to approve the purchase of the property at 2903 Westminster Drive from ISCEC for 100000 and authorize our acting county manager to negotiate and execute a contract. Motion by Commissioner McNeely. Any further discussion? Apologize, I was mixing up the two I different know, ones. I, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> all right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thanks for sticking to your guns. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, now circle back to new business is uh, some uh, informational uh, okay looks like this is the uh, <coughs> y'all gonna have to I'm gonna pull them out of here now I may talk for a while now this season uh, no. a couple <laughs> motions but I won't talk that long because we got to go uh, wanted to touch base uh, tomorrow night I'm scheduled to go and I will give you more info on the way back but believe me I, I've got my mind kind of made up uh, Charlotte Regional Transportation uh, Project Outlay and uh, Gaston Cleveland uh, Lincoln uh, MPO are meeting together and the reason is is they're continuing to want to find support for their uh, probably close to one billion dollar 17 mile long road with two bridges that cross over the Catawba River into the lower part of Mecklenburg County uh, about where the uh, upscale residential neighborhoods are going to be to the backside of Charlotte Douglas Airport. Uh, and the reason I have problems with this project, just to lay it out in front of everybody, we share the same division as Gaston and Lincoln and uh, Cleveland do. So, uh, but we are locked into the uh, MPO with Charlotte Union or Mecklenburg and Union counties. So we have a crosshair of here of funds getting pulled out of both sides of our transportation kitty funding by this project. Not only would it hurt us in the CARPO, in the Charlotte Regional, uh, but it'll also affect us in our Division 12 money. And it has not been able to score well because it's a bad project. It's a very, very expensive project that is not necessary uh, they have eight lanes of traffic going across on 85 across the uh, Catawba River, plus they have Highway 74, which is four lanes of traffic. And we don't need this here. This is all about uh, developing residential and giving access to a part of uh, Gaston County that has probably as rural or maybe more so than uh, Harmony Union Grove area. And not saying that Harmon Union Grove don't deserve something, but I'm saying we don't need to spend close to a billion dollars, and most of it come out of our funding for this road. And so I will definitely go down there. I've had to fight this at two or three CARPO meetings, and so uh, they now they took it away. They kind of moved it out of our CARPO meeting and put it at a special meeting to join together. I guess figuring some of us didn't want to show up, and they put it at 5 o'clock in Charlotte, which makes it fun, too. I'll have to take off like at 10 tomorrow morning to get there with the traffic. So uh, anyway, just uh, giving you a heads up, uh, it's, it's probably going to be a mess, and I hope no, y'all don't have to come down and send Lisa to bail me out of jail. That's the main thing. Uh, also, uh, in having one of our last meetings, I had Chairman Bowles fill in for me while we went to Washington, D.C., and I appreciate you going to our I-77 Toll Road Advisory Committee. I think he got enlightened. Uh, I do to every time I go. To say the least. <laughs> 
But uh, we have got down now in this last meeting where uh, we're in our option phase. I think here we've got one more meeting scheduled. There may be another one after that to see if everybody can put their pieces together. But uh, I'm thinking that probably here after this next meeting, we will uh, we will have an uh, we will have an option that comes out of this committee. Now, whether it's heard or used, I'll be interesting to see how it fits into the grand scheme of things. Uh, but uh, have really learned a whole lot about the inner workings of a uh, transportation contract and an 1,800-page one at that and just how much, we'll just call it stuff, is in it <laughs> at this point in time. So uh, I'll hopefully report back to you on that by our next commissioner meeting too, but I, I ask you to pray for me at both of these because they're very challenging situations for a man that doesn't have the patience that he should have. So When Mr. McNeely asked me to go to that meeting, I thought, well, yeah, I can attend another meeting. That's not a problem. And he says, uh, Mr. Bowles, it's a lot like drinking from a fire hose. And he understated that. Mm -hmm. It really is. <laughs> My goodness. You're, we're talking about half a billion dollars here and half a billion dollars there. Pretty soon, you, you're talking about some real money. And if I could just uh, amplify a little bit about uh, Commissioner McNeely's uh, discussion on this bridge across uh, Catawba River. Two uh, bridges. Two bridges. Two, well, it goes across <laughs> to an island. Yeah, yeah. So it's two bridges. Um, it's essentially creating a, an, uh, it's an economic development tool to give a, a river district effect on both sides, which has appeal as an economic development project for both Gaston and Mecklenburg County. Um, but when you look at roads, which is the pot of money we're pulling this out of, uh, the, the new uh, criteria for deciding where roads ought to go is scored on objective analysis. Uh, and That's the, the primary uh, scoring mechanism or the, the weighted criteria is congestion. And there is no congestion as, as uh, Commissioner McNeely noted, it's got eight lanes of I-85 and there's just not congestion on that. Um, so uh, we're fortunate to have him to be able to speak up and, and speak the truth and speak it to power because, you know, Unfortunately, Charlotte does have, you know, 48 percent or so of the voting power in this CRTPO. Um, that's not to say this shouldn't be built, but there's other mechanisms to do it. You know, you can use a tax increment grant. You could toll it. You could do whatever you wanted, uh, but it doesn't need to be a project that sucks the oxygen out of the budget for Division 10 and Division 12 for virtually every other road project. It, so. It'll take all the money out of uh, D Division 12 and uh, and F also, both. And, you know, F is 16 counties, and I think Division 12 is six counties. So, in, it, yeah, and the six counties lie in the bigger one. So, I mean, it's just going to clear out the whole, everything from boom down that whole swath of the state is going to suck all the money out for this one project. Anyway, good luck. Yeah. Like I said, pray for me. All right. <laughs> okay. I believe uh, that leaves only the county manager's report. Thank you, Mr. J I don't want to stand between everyone and, and adjournment, so I have three quick reminders. As proclaimed at our last commissioner meeting, uh, next week is National Telecommunicators Week. And Tuesday, April the 10th, is their annual banquet. It will be a cooperative extension from 3 until 5, just to make sure you have that on your calendar. Also, next Friday, April the 13th, is our annual Employee Service Awards banquet. Again, it will be held at cooperative extension, and that begins at 8 a.m. And last but certainly not least, the next commissioner meeting, which is April the 17th, we will have a presentation for the board to update you on our two large construction projects, our jail expansion and our public safety building. 
Both of those projects are going vertical, so we wanted to give you an update and let you know how those projects are moving forward. That will be a good follow-up to the two articles in the paper about both those buildings. Okay, any further items for the good of the order? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion to adjourn. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. We are adjourned.